Okay, so it's just after 12, um, 12 o'clock here on Tuesday, and we want to respect everybody's time and get started on our program. Um, at this point, if you're having any problems hearing us or you have any issues, go ahead and, and hop on the, the uh, chat feature and you can um, uh, send us questions, let us know, and we will do what we can to make sure that everything's working for you. So, um, as we get started, we're going to be talking today about the practical challenges for reopening our, our uh, commercial offices now that the lockdown is um, being lightened. Um, this webinar is being sponsored by the Commercial Real Estate Professionals Network here in San Francisco. The network is a group of real estate professionals who are committed to educating the commercial real estate industry regarding changes in the industry and trends. Um, as we all know, there's no bigger change these days than the impact of the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic and um, the lockdown that's followed and now the reopening that the state's trying to go through. So we're gonna be talking today about some of the very real practical challenges facing both landlords and tenants as we try to go back into our offices safely. Uh, I am Alex Hamilton. I am the uh, managing partner of Versant Law Group, a boutique uh, um, real estate and business uh, firm uh, located in the heart of the financial district in San Francisco. Uh, my practice is, has been uh, primarily focused on commercial real estate for the last 35 years. Um, but before becoming an attorney, I used to be a CPA, uh, which gives me an um, opportunity to sort of understand uh, how businesses work uh, and how law interacts with um, the day-to-day -day dealings of a business. Finally, in addition to practicing law, I am the author of the California Real Estate Forums, which is published by West Group. It's a seven volume set that's primarily accessed over Westlaw. Um, now, uh, I just want to take a moment here and introduce for everybody our two um, speakers. Uh, today, we have David Dixon and Brian Hobbs, both with the um, Rue Associates, which is a national environmental consulting firm. David has over 30 years as an environmental consultant with extensive experience working with um, building developers, owners, and managers as they assess and mitigate human health risks. Uh, Brian is a certified safety professional and a certified industrial hygienist. He has extensive experience advising and consulting with commercial landlords and tenants in implementing and managing biosafety protocols and biosafety programs. I hope I got that more or less close to right, guys. Uh, at this point, I think we're going to just turn it over to you guys. And David, you can take it away. Yeah, Eric, could you show the slide deck? I'm not seeing them show up right now. All right, let's move on. Oh, I think we're at the end right here. All right, so uh, Alex just had a chance to talk about, kind of give some introductions. Um, I just wanted to let you know who Rue Associates is. So we're a national consulting firm. We put, um, you know, all of our people are trained for hazardous waste operations. So for years we've had people in biohazard uh, situations, chemical hazard situations. So this has kind of been our wheelhouse, this type of thing and the, the issues we're dealing with now. 
So this presentation is really geared towards uh, building owners, managers, and um, you know developers of, of office properties. Um, we talk about California a few times specifically because that's kind of our audience, but a lot of what we're talking about here is pretty universal. It can be applied in different areas. Um, so we're going to go through preparing your building for reoccupancy. What are the main issues from common areas, air quality, HVAC systems? We're going to touch on elevators, cleaning, uh, disinfections. We're going to talk about issues we have seen with, uh, you know, what we're calling buyer beware with uh, being flooded with vendors and products that people say you need for this. And then the types of notifications that are required and that you need to plan for. And finally, we've got a pretty extensive list put together of resources. And that includes um, documents from CDC, OSHA, state, local uh, agencies. We've got an abbreviated uh, link directly to those documents in the presentation and a much longer one. So if you guys, when you uh, signed in, if you have um, signed in with information, you can pro we'll provide links to where you can download that. All right, next. So what are we looking at? I mean, really the big challenges are as we reopen. And while we're calling it reopening, in what we've actually seen is in a lot of the big office buildings, at least 20% of tenants never left. I mean, there've been a lot of been in essential services, everything from legal to possibly healthcare management or other things. So for a lot of um, our clients and a lot of building owners out there, it's really going to be a phased approach of ramping up as people start coming uh, back to the office. And I think what we've seen, for instance, Google announcing that the majority of their clients or their uh, employees probably won't be back in the office until the end of the year. That even as things get opened up, you're still gonna see a reduction. At the same time, there's a big concern about how do you protect your own staff and how do you protect your tenants and make them feel like it's a safe place to come back to. And finally, it's important to know that these guidance are changing quickly. Every week, when we prepared this presentation a week ago, we had to update links to new documents from the same agencies that came out a week later. So a lot of this stuff is, is changing. All right, next. So California is currently on, they have a reopening roadmap. Yesterday, they said we are currently in stage two of this four stage. Um, so they're gradually opening things up. One of the issues though is this reopening is based on metrics. It's not based on dates and the metrics can be kind of squishy, both on what they're measuring and how they count it. So um, unfortunately we can't say at you know, June 1st we'll be doing this or anything else. But, so you're gonna see kind of, you're gonna have to keep appraised and as things continue. For instance, last week we saw all construction suddenly was allowed in California. Um, and in many areas, like in the Bay Area, only affordable housing construction components um, were allowed to be worked on before. Um, so in any case, I'm now going to turn this over to Brian to go through some of the technical issues that we're dealing with and, and how we've addressed it. Great. Thanks, David. Hey everybody. Um, I'm going to go quickly through a couple concepts that I see, you know, people in your industry who are dealing with. Um, first, I want to talk about, you know, preparing your building for reoccupancy starts with staff pr protection considerations. Um, the first thing that a lot of you should have already started to think about um, and mull through is developing a building response plan. Um, for those of you in California, which is probably most of the people who are on this call, um, California just instituted some additional guidance for workplaces, construction, office workspaces that talk to some of the requirements, one being a COVID-19 response plan. Um, so the big thing behind that is what do I see? I get a lot of questions. What is that? What does it look like? Well, I see that as a couple things. I see it as infection control, um, prevention measures. I see it as a social distancing plan what your site specific cleaning and disinfection protocols are, and then what your internal response of a suspected or confirmed COVID-19 positive case would be. Um, over the course of this, we're also gonna come back to a new norm. And as such, we should be reevaluating our risk for people who work for you in, in whatever environment, facility, building, 
um, what have you. And understand that you know, their day-to-day -day operations could have some risk associated with being exposed to COVID-19. So OSHA has some really good guidance on how you evaluate that risk, and they provide some you know, streamlined um, risk assessment tools for different occupations. So I definitely suggest going out there, and, and, and it's gonna be provided in some of the links where you can actually go through and understand where your risk really lies. Um, all things considered, based on the information that's really currently available and provided, you know, your very high to high risk uh, occupations are really in the healthcare industry. Those people are on the front lines, they're dealing with it, first responders, things like that. You know, as we start to bring buildings back online, I, I consider that, you know, anywhere from medium to low risk category, depending on what's, what's being done in the facility. Um, one of the things to remember is that a key thing that a lot of people forget about is having the availability to hand washing stations and hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer th like flew off the shelves in a matter of days after a couple news reports came out about COVID-19 crossing the borders. Meanwhile, it was already past our border months prior to that being released. Um, and, and a lot of the supplies are, are dwindling and you know you can't get it anywhere. So you're gonna wanna make sure before you're reoccupying, you have adequate supplies, you have adequate hand washing facilities at your, at your buildings. Another thing to consider is staggering work hours to reduce density. Does everybody who works for you, do they need to be in the building? Can they work remote? You know, try to reduce density. That's the big thing up front in the first couple initial stages. Um, you reduce density, you reduce contact, you reduce potentials for asymptomatic people to infect others. You know, keep that, keep number of the population down as much as, as you can, and at least in the initial stages. And then access control. We talk to health screening. What does that look like? Is that temperature tech, uh, checks? Is that forms, questionnaires that people fill out? Do people go out for the antibody or for the, the actual test for the virus? In some cases, it's hard to, to get understand that there's significant limitations associated with a lot of these health screening tools. And then realize that you should also be, you know, getting HR involved or legal counsel involved because the way in which you go about this, there's specific privacy concerns associated with it. So it's really important, you know, you don't develop everything just in a silo or in a vacuum. You need to pull in specific stakeholders to address a lot of these concerns. Um, and the one thing that I wanted to just throw in here, and, and I've been hearing a lot of this lately, and I go to stores and I see certain things as far as signage goes, you know, at least in the early stages, if you're developing logistics plans like one-way offices, you know, understanding where people go, where, where people can't go, you know, how, how many staff do you need on site to actually enforce social distancing guidance? Because I think people, it's almost like herding cats to some degree, people don't understand where to go and, and it gets very confusing. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure you have somebody on site if you can to just kind of you know steward that process. Next slide. So common areas, so uh, one thing I'm seeing as best practices is setting up social distancing signage, social cues, um, where people can stand, where they can't stand, um, thinking about you know, lobbies, rearranging furniture to promote social distancing or remove seating entirely. You, know, uh, you wanna reduce anywhere where multiple people can congregate in one area as much as possible, at least in the initial stages of this whole thing, as we start to bring people back online. And then going back to, I mean, I've dealt with laboratories for a very long time. And one of the things that always came up was we would not allow for porous materials to be allowed into the lab because it becomes very onerous to actually clean and disinfect this material. In most cases, we'd actually, if it was contaminated, we'd take it, dispose of it as biohazard and have it sent off for incineration. Um, here, that wouldn't be the case, but think about how you stage furniture. Do you need the furniture there? Is it porous? If it is, then maybe you should either think about, you know, how can you encapsulate it, wrap it temporarily, because it's going to be very difficult to clean and disinfect. And then controlling access, going to quickly touch on this. This has to do with thermal tenant screening. There's a lot of new products out there and um, new devices where people 
you, you could look into it and they scan your face and they tell you whether or not you have a temperature or not. There's some limitations associated with that and, and you really need to vet those technologies first before you pull the trigger and just spend $100,000 because it, it really, it may not make sense for your specific application. And I have a note at the bottom, and, and this goes for everything, especially now, communication is key. You want to be as transparent as you can with your tenants, with your key stakeholders, so they understand what you're doing is in the best interest of not only the, you know, the facility you work for, the building you own, but also the health and safety of you know, the tenants, the community, um, and everyone else, because they want to understand. There's, there's a huge fear of the unknown right now, and, and there's a lot of that because we're still getting a lot more scientific data and we're start, starting to understand how this really you know, moves about and, and transmits. So it's really important that you upfront have, have that transparent communication. Um, just quickly, I want to talk about additional common area um, topics. So this would have to do with staggering work shifts to reduce crowding during peak hours. I get this question a lot. How am I going to reduce, you know, people in the lobby? Um, and I, I think that if you work with your tenants to understand, you know, when do people come in? How can we funnel them through quickly process people? Um, and understand that if you can stagger those times, you're reducing the potential for touch points and be able to enforce more social distancing. Um, common bathrooms, this is another one. Um, and, I, and I just wanted to mention too, if you do have visitors to the site or things like that, you kind of want to dedicate certain locations like a bathroom or you know facilities that they can use because it's really important from a contact tracing standpoint that you reduce them going into another space that could potentially infect others in the workplace so it's really important to dedicate that but as far as the common bathrooms go you want to remove touch points like everybody touches everything um, so you're looking at sink faucets you know towel dispensers doors um, I worked at a facility that we spent probably $2 million just redoing the doors to hand wave operation because we were fearful of cross contamination. Um, so it's really important that you start thinking about it. Some should be sh short term measures where you prop doors open and then long term, maybe you put in the hand wave. And then um, exhaust fans, you should be running exhaust fans in those common bathroom areas 24 seven. Um, there have been some studies where um, the virus was detected in fecal matter, and there's also studies that show you flush a toilet, there's significant bioaerosols that are generated from it. Am I saying that it's a mode of transmission? No, not right now. I don't have that scientific data. But from a standpoint that you have all these things going on and more people getting processed through these areas because they have to go to the bathroom, you should have ample ventilation in these spaces. Um, food services and kitchen areas. So this is another one. It's trying to set up effective social distancing. We have in here discouraged everyone leaving the site for lunch. Um, I, I think it's hard to manage that, but I think that if you can set up workplaces and cafeterias in a sense that you could still maintain social distancing and have adequate ventilation, um, you'll be better for it. So air quality concerns. We get a lot of questions on, you know, what is what is this, what is ventilation, exhaust ventilation gonna look like, you know, post COVID-19? There's a lot of information that is going out there as terms of super spreaders. This is big because if you're in areas and workplaces where there isn't significant ventilation and it, it's very poor ventilation, you're not getting the air exchanges you need, you know, there is a chance that you are gonna potentially transmit it if the person's asymptomatic and they're talking, um, there, there's been cases of this, and you're going to see more and more of this come out in the news. Um, so it's really important that you know certain um, certain guidelines have been established to basically minimize the potential for infectious aerosols. So I'm going to point you to basically ASHRAE came out with a position document on infectious aerosols, where they updated some guidance. Now it's it's a lot of information, so I'm not going to go through all of it now but it's really important. I'm gonna to touch on just a couple key, key aspects of this. Um, you're gonna to wanna to think to installing MERV 13 filters or higher in your systems. Um, and I, the caveat to that is you wanna make sure your system can actually handle this. 
There could be pressure drops in the ventilation um, and other considerations that you know are specific to your site. So you're gonna wanna talk to your HVAC contractor now and get an understanding because I can tell you it's it's likely that a lot of the supplies for filters and other um, measures that upgrades and modifications to systems, HVAC systems, uh, are gonna be in short supply, uh, at least initially. So start talking and engaging with your HVAC contractors to get that on board and making upgrades. And then you're also gonna to wanna to consider increasing your outdoor air ventilation. So I get a lot of uh, questions on that because there's a lot of indoor air complaints. And prior to COVID-19, I dealt with a lot of indoor air complaints and it ended up being that you know, the fresh air intake was completely shut. So all they were doing was just re recirculating air all day long and, you know, some smelly operations. So it's really important that they open that fresh air intake to about 100% um, or at least to the point where your system can handle it because there's, there's constant heating and cooling load that you need and you may not be able to satisfy everybody. But right now, I mean, the more you can get to 100%, the better off you're going to be. Um, and you also want to consider running the HVAC system, you know, two hours prior to and after normal occupancy in flush modes. So you've seen, I've seen that in, you know, lead accredited buildings where you're flushing, flushing out the buildings after you put furnitures, fixtures, things like that in there. And that's to reduce the overall VOC content, content in the space. So this kind of is the same premise. You're kind of flushing the building out of potential bioaerosols. Um, the other piece to this is, and I don't have listed on the slide, is you also want to maintain a certain humidity. And I believe the humidity is anywhere from like 40 to 60 percent. And that's prime because that helps, you know, put those particles when somebody coughs, sneezes in the air, those large particles settle. They, not, they, won't, they won't sit in the air very long. So in like very dry air, um, if somebody sneezes, you know, the large particles settle out, but then that the small ones will actually sit and float in the air and they can be in the air for quite some time. So trying to shoot for that 40 to 60 humidity is, is a really good step point. And then on the flip side, you know, as a result of cleaning and disinfection, and we'll talk to that in a couple slides, you know, increased disinfection is going to end up meaning more chemicals in the air. So what is that going to look like for, for your building? Um, so it's really important to understand that, hey, you know, should you be cleaning and disinfecting when people are right there? I mean, you have to develop site-specific protocols to understand and think about all the things that you're doing, um, which could impact, you know, health and safety on other fronts. So that goes back to indoor air quality. So you want to make sure that if you are doing that with chemicals, you have ample ventilation. And then Legionella, I'm going to quickly touch on. So if you had to shut, shut off building systems um, and you know, just leave and, and wash your hands, close up and leave, what ends up happening is you know, Legionella could basically grow if it has right conditions. And typically, depending on where that water temperature fluctuates to, if it's prime condition for growth, you could see pretty rampant growth and anywhere from seven to 10 days in a dormant HVAC system. So it's really important to understand that um, there's guidance that the CDC has issued for um, bringing back cooling towers, I believe, and HVAC systems, as well as the American Industrial Hygiene Association also has guidance on bringing some of those systems back online. So definitely good resources. So elevators, this is the, um, I, I think, a big topic that everybody has a lot of questions on. How do I you know, manage people going in and out of the elevators. And, and right now, I, I don't have a silver bullet. Um, a lot of the guidance that's out there basically says, just limit the number of people in it. Um, does, that, does that help us very much? Probably not. Um, so you're gonna wanna think about how you can actually vent these elevator cabins more um, and, and consider that, you know, many older elevator units, probably you retrofitted and made really nice modern and when you did that, you actually blocked any of the actual vents um, to the cab. So you're actually just getting stale air in the elevator cab. So it's really important to, to consider upgrading your elevator, elevator ventilation and make sure you're not blocking any of these vents. Um, right now, I don't believe there's any standard elevator filtration units that you can purchase in the market. 
I just haven't seen anything yet. And anything I have seen has been from overseas. Um, so it's really in the next like couple weeks, months, I think you're going to see an increase in um, elevator companies trying to look at how do they vent out and provide other means to, you know, circulate air better and clean the air in these elevator uh, cabs. And then just lastly, traffic management, it, this goes back to social distancing and staggering people coming in and out. If you're able to stagger times for people to come in and out, you're going to end up limiting the number of total people and you're not going to have people waiting as much. So you're going to want to also limit the number of people in the elevators. So that's, that's a key thing. Um, and probably most likely in most states, they're still going to require cloth face covering. So that actually limits, that'll potentially limit, you know, anybody transmitting uh, anything just by standard breathing. Uh, so the big thing to understand is if you do have two people in there, they shouldn't be in there talking to each other. That's just, you're just spewing, you know, potential virus, viral particles in the air. That's not needed. So, you know, establish clear guidelines on how to use the elevator and then just make sure in those first couple weeks that you start to bring people back in if you have to have security there or if you have to have you know an attendant so they can funnel people in and out safely that would be better and going back to you know see if you can encourage use of stairwells on the lower floors and then have one that goes up and one that goes down um, and that's just to limit any sort of contact between people so cleaning considerations so we get a lot of questions on this and it's funny because we went best practice right away was the minute I had a COVID positive individual in my building, I'm cleaning everything. I am fogging everything. I am fumigating everything. And that's, that's how it was carried out in the early stage of the stages. So it's since been slightly changed. Um, and that's based on, we've, we've had and seen some studies that show how long the virus actually lives on surfaces. Um, and New England Journal of Medicine published a study that, you know, the SARS-CoV-2 virus can live on surfaces from anywhere from four to 72 hours. Um, and, and that ranges depending on temperature and humidity. Um, so the big thing with that is, you know, four hours for copper. So copper has its own antimicrobial uh, properties and cardboard was 24 hours, stainless steel was 48 hours, and then your typical plastics are 72 hours. So in a common workplace, you're seeing a lot of, you know, nice door handles that are probably stainless steel or likely not copper or copper alloy. Um, your plastics that you touch regularly, um, buttons, things like that. So it, it can live on surfaces for a significant amount of time. So that's why it's really important you develop a good cleaning and disinfectant protocol for all those high touch surfaces. And I'll get to that in a second. So the CDC issued an updated guidance for cleaning like after a COVID positive person has entered your building. So a lot of folks who haven't been in their buildings in the last, you know, let's say 20, 30 days, you know, I get requests, hey, I want to come in and do a deep clean for COVID-19. You know, you really don't have to do that based on the guidance. I mean, it's unless somebody went in there and touched everything and coughed and spewed over everything, then, then I'd say, yeah, definitely you need to do something. But if nobody's been in the space, theoretically COVID-19 didn't just magically appear. So it's really not something you need to do. Um, and going back to routine enhanced cleaning, the LA Department of Health actually put, provides a very good detailed matrix on how, how you can outline your cleaning and disinfectant protocol. So it's really important to understand that you know, routine cleaning should happen all the time. That's like touching surfaces, that cleaning surfaces that aren't readily touched. Whereas like your enhanced deep cleaning, that should be your high touch surfaces where you go through, you clean with a soap um, or a surfactant, you wipe it down. So you get the dirt, grime, biofilm, whatever. And then you go back and you use a disinfectant, which will kill it. But the big thing with that is you need to make sure you're using the right disinfectant for the right surface. So the manufacturer specifies different disinfectants for specific applications. So those applications you wanna make sure are in line with what your protocol is saying. 
I do get a lot of questions, can our existing staff or janitorial service, you know, do this kind of cleaning? And I, I think that if they're properly trained and they understand what the risks are from an OSHA perspective, as well as from a CDC guidelines perspective on how to clean, I think existing staff and janitorial services will likely be able to do your standard enhanced deep cleaning and enhanced cleaning and disinfection, sorry, um, for those high touch surfaces. Um, we also get a lot of questions on when to call a specialist. So deep cleaning. Um, and typically this is when you have someone who's COVID positive or all of a sudden you have an outbreak like the meat packing industry. That, that's a prime like Petri dish for, uh, for people to get infected. I mean, you have low temperatures, everybody's together. Um, they're, they're processing things. Everything's like, like really tight knit. So that's where you're going to get a lot of these outbreaks. But if you start having cluster outbreaks in your building, it, it may be time to just call a specialist and say, Hey, you know, I'm having these issues. I, I want somebody to come in and look at it. And then what to clean and surface air testing. So we get a lot of questions on, hey, what do we clean? Originally it was, we're gonna clean everything. Like we're gonna write down surfaces that nobody's ever gonna to touch. So that really didn't make a lot of sense. So really it's the focus should be on high touch surfaces um, and, and making sure that you're approaching those in a way where you're cleaning it with the correct disinfectant, you're cleaning it with the right disinfectant as well um, and making sure that you're covering all the areas. Um, as far as surface air testing, depending on your industry, what your requirement is, it doesn't make a lot of sense um, in a lot of cases. Uh, the only thing that it will do is it'll validate your cleaning effectiveness, but whether or not, if somebody tells you, oh, now it's safe to re-enter the building, I took 20 swipes, I, I, I really would just err on the side of caution because I, I don't see that one is practical and two, I think they're doing you a disservice. Um, so I, I really think it, the focus is on having the right person do the, the regular cleaning um, and making sure you're using the adequate dis disinfectants. Because in all honesty, the minute you do this testing, you ship it off, you know, it's 24 hours, you know, to get there, 24 hours to uh, analyze it. And then by the time you get the results, it would have already been dead on the surface anyway. So it, those things, you know, you have to be careful with how you address that. And then lastly, I'm not gonna read everything. Um, this is a lot of information, but the LA County Department of Health has a cleaning matrix. We're providing the link for everybody who's on, the, um, on attendance um, and you know, go through it. There's a lot of useful information out there that you can start to pull from um, and don't get you know, fooled. And, and Dave, I'm gonna hand it over to Dave and he's gonna finish up the presentation, but there's, there's a lot of things out there that are very useful. Hi there. So one of the things that we've seen is a lot of uh, vendors potentially capitalizing on the pandemic and the fear to sell products. And you have to be careful to really realize what you may or may not need. Um, as Brian talked about, we've had clients that have first notification, they'll spend 30, 40, 50,000 to have a deep cleaning. And that's what a vendor's telling them they need to do. Whereas in reality, as this uh, is projected to increase the number of people with this, you may be getting notifications every week that someone in your building has been that. And it's probably not sustainable to shut things down and to do that cleaning. In the building we're in, in downtown Oakland, our, um, our landlord said, if we find, we hear of anyone in a building that's, that's positive, we're gonna shut the whole building down, everyone's out, we're gonna clean everything. That's just not gonna be sustainable. Um, so making sure you're realistic about what's really necessary. Um, that's where we've tried to help steer clients into what is and isn't appropriate. Um, and then Brian talked on post cleanup testing. Again, the swabs and the wipe samples are not that common, but they are starting to, to ramp up. It is possible to test, but know that it's going to take probably 24 hours to send it to one of the few labs that does it, another 24 hours to get the results back. So you're gonna have two days of tenants going back and forth in the building before you even get those results. And the moment a tenant comes back in, those results are pretty much meaningless as far as being able to say it's clean or not clean. So 
be wary of any sampling except if you're just trying to confirm that the cleaning was effective at that moment and that the contract is doing the right work. The other thing we've seen is you know, safe touch products, products that uh, could be stickers you put on door frames, uh, it could be emulsions or paints you put on stuff that uh, could be self sanitizing. Very many of these where we've actually gone in and we've requested white paper studies from the vendors doing it, they can't find it or they can't provide it. Or in one case, they even told us, no, we're not allowed to provide that. So there's very little data on some of these products that they kill, you know, bacteria, viruses, or anything. So really make sure you do your homework. There's going to be, there's a lot of stuff now where people are pushing these products that may not be effective. Next slide. So notifications and actions. So this is important. A lot of localities, uh, de departments of health, cities, counties are requiring that building managers uh, uh, basically notify them if they've had a COVID positive person in the building and they're trying to keep track of what's going on. So make sure you know your locality and that you're complying with that. The other thing is you need to establish procedures now for requiring tenants to notify you if they've had someone COVID positive in the building. So make sure that's clear. Um, this and then on the next bullet I'm going to talk about, you probably want to vet that through your legal counsel to make sure that uh, what you're asking for is appropriate and what you're expecting is appropriate. Because um, the other is establish procedures to notify the rest of your tenants if you get a notification from one that there's been someone in the building. Um, make sure you you have that Ideally, you have that established and those letters prepared before you get your first notification. So you're not trying to whip this up in a few hours. Um, determine a decision tree. And this goes back to the response plan that Brian talked about that in California, they're now requiring. Um, make sure you've got a tr decision tree for what you're cleaning, what disinfection you're doing, that you have this in place and hopefully either your existing janitorial staff or a new you know, vendor that can come in and do this and have that set up so you're not in a panic trying to get this done. And then a decision tree for your tenant spaces. What we've seen is that a building may pay for and do the cleaning in the common areas elevators, but the tenants are actually required to do a certain level of cleaning within their space to make sure it doesn't spread back through the building. And that oftentimes might be the tenant's responsibility to pay for that. So make sure that that's clear too. Uh, next slide. So this is just an example of some of the links that we've put together. Um, the OSHA resources on this, we list the some OSHA, CDC, California, um, Building Contract Association. We've got a, uh, several pages of these links that go actually to the document because, for instance, the CDC website can be really hard to navigate and find all these things. So again, we'll send this out to people and we'll send out a link where you can download those. And as we talked about, these things are changing quite a bit. So we've also included links to where you can get the general website to try and find the latest update if these have changed. And I think with that, we're gonna be going to questions. Okay, great. Well, guys, I think that was a really uh, wonderful presentation. There's obviously a whole lot of information out there and we just scratched the surface today. Um, before we jump into questions and we have a few from uh, people who are watching, uh, we all, I'm gonna, uh, I just wanna mention for everybody that this is being recorded. Um, and if you did register and we have your email, we will be sending you a uh, link to the recording we'll send you a link to these resources. Uh, we have a resource page that we're gonna have, and we're gonna probably send out a um, feedback survey because uh, this is our second webinar, um, and we're planning on continuing this um, every two or three weeks uh, as we try to address various things that come up. Um, Currently, we're going to probably be doing one about some of the legal issues that are involved um, with uh, COVID. That's, uh, as an attorney, I get a lot of questions on that, but it's way beyond what we can do today. 
So there, we will probably put on a presentation regarding legal issues. We will also be looking at some of the um, uh, opportunities to use virtual um, options like Zoom and some other services to cut down on physical presence um, by people and still conduct business. So that's gonna be um, coming up as well. Uh, so uh, make sure that you did leave us your, um, your email address. We will send you links to all this stuff. Um, now we're gonna, we're gonna jump into some of the questions uh, that have uh, come up. And one of the questions uh, was whether or not um, landlords should allow a regular janitorial staff back into tenant spaces or try to push this over onto tenants. Um, uh, as an attorney, if one of my clients came to me and asked me this question, I would say, uh, yes, you really do want to keep your janitorial staff coming in and cleaning. Uh, that way you control the amount of cleaning that's done, how it's done, uh, and you can um, be alerted to possible issues in tenant spaces. Uh, I mean, remember that uh, anybody who's going to sue is going to go after people with deep pockets. Uh, usually that's going to mean the landlord and the tenant may or may not have deep pockets. So ultimately, because you're exposed uh, legally, potentially, um, you should be the one to make sure that things are being cleaned adequately um, and that you're protecting your tenants um, in accordance with governmental guidelines and best practices. So um, that would be my answer to that. Do you guys have any thoughts on that, Brian or David? Well, uh, Dave, I'll have you go first. Okay, I was just gonna say, I've seen um, I several janitorial companies now have been putting out flyers and information saying, we're meeting the current CDC training guidance for our, uh, you know, for our people and we're training them, we're getting them up to speed. So making sure that yes, you can't just have uh, anyone who hasn't gone through that doing this, but I, I see that people are catching up and they wanna make sure that, you know, they keep doing work and they still can work. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah, so I think it, it goes to your point with properly vetting the subcontractors um, that you use for cleaning. And, and that starts with how does a subcontractor on the flip side monitor their own workers health. And that, that's another key thing is because you're going to allow visitors outside of your norm to come in and clean your spaces, they could be asymptomatic, but if with the proper precautions taken, and if you have more control over that, I think you're reducing your risk down the line by making sure you have everything up front and the company's doing the right thing. Great. Um, so we have a question here about HIPAA rules. Does building management basically sort of identify people who have been tested positive or is there really probably even a requirement that they be alerted? Um, I'm not sure about the answer to that. That's a great question and will probably get addressed in the, on the legal issues um, webinar when we get that pulled together. Um, one of the things that, that um, I'm concerned about personally is, is what, at what point do we distinguish between uh, inf notifying people that somebody's been exposed as compared to somebody actually being tested positive? Um, and, and w w what are people doing? I mean, I know that, that um, uh, you know, personally, my wife got um, a phone call from her doctor, um, which was not the kind of phone call you want, saying, oh, I'm really sorry, but I had been exposed to COVID-19 before I saw you, and I just wanted to let you know that I had been exposed, and now you may be, have been exposed. Um, sadly, he actually did contract COVID-19, uh, but it's, it's one of those things where, you know, guys, I'm, I'm really curious if you're seeing a distinction between reporting of exposure as compared to actual testing positive. Well, you know, when it comes to HIPAA, again, that's, you know, 
there's that real balance and that goes beyond kind of our area of expertise as far as what constitutes, you know, protected privacy versus trying to be alert and contact tracing, you know, everyone in your building. Um, what I've seen is that tenants have said, we had someone not giving their name who tested positive. They were in here last Tuesday. Um, they were here half the day and that was the last time they were here. So, you know, I don't think they're asking for who is it and, you know, that type of name, but obviously there's, you know, HIPAA pri medical privacy issues with that. Right. And I do think that there probably, we're probably going to see changes to HIPAA as we go along, because I think there is a compelling public interest in knowing if someone you were in contact with actually um, tested positive. So the, these sort, these two things, um, you know, just uh, are, are going to meet head on, uh, legally speaking, and we're going to need uh, laws that that identify um, uh, what you're supposed to be alerted about. Um, I, I'm really curious um, uh, about what you guys think when a landlord or a tenant should actually do a deep clean? Um, or is it is it sufficient to just sort of um, continue to wipe down and, and disinfect um, common touch surfaces? Well, so I, I think here the caveat is it, it, it depends on a lot of things, the type of facility you have, the building. Um, you know, we, we brought out that LA County uh, cleaning matrix because it's one of the few agencies we've seen put forward you know, here's the steps, here's the plan for different types of cleaning, depending on the exposure. So again, that's one of the few agency uh, promulgated ones. So that's certainly a starting point. I think that one of the, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues as far as, you know, first of all, making sure that your building is as uh, secure as possible so that you've eliminated, you know, through the, what we talked about as far as traffic patterns and eliminating touch points. You know, if you keep, you know, fabric sofas in your lobby and you have to clean those every time, that's going to be crazy. So it's making sure you do that. And I think the other part of that's going to be communication. As I said, the, the office building we were in, I was surprised when I saw their first notification early on before the shelter in place saying, if we get anyone in here, we're kicking everyone out of the building. It's a big building. Um, and cleaning everything. So that's not going to be sustainable. So make sure you commit to something you can actually do, especially as, as these things start to ramp up. Um, other than that, it, it's, you know, come up with a plan now on what that's going to be. And Brian, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I think um, uh, you touched on most of the points, which it really depends on the facility. It depends on the operations. It depends on how you can facilitate uh, disinfection. Not all facilities you'll be able to go in and use, let's say, vaporized hydrogen peroxide. You, you, it would destroy some of the furniture, fixtures, things like that. Um, so it comes back to, and, and before, the question before, contact tracing is very important. Um, before the CDC actually started issuing guidelines, which uh, I think it only came in, came out in May, sometime in May, we internally, as far as RUE, um, we developed our own contact tracing program uh, to filter out, I think it was five or six scenarios where we can make educated decisions on, okay, this person contacted this person, this person. So we had a decision tree matrix already established. So it's really important that if you're able to do successful contact tracing, you can eliminate the need to do a deep clean if the person wasn't in, even in that location. So it's really important that from a contact tracing perspective, you can go back and, and really go through and dis clean and disinfect all those surfaces that that person actually came into contact with. And again, you gotta remember that anytime you're gonna be doing uh, cleaning after a suspected case, you're kinda gonna shut down the, the area for at least 24 hours. So that allows for the, the area to vent out, particles to settle, that, settle out, and, and during that point, there probably should be no viable virus in the air. So that's why it's really key that you follow the CDC guidelines when it comes to, and it's pretty straightforward. The, the site is like, my head's gonna explode how many times they update the site because I have to constantly look for different things. But 
if you follow some of the, the outline, what's outlined there and do contact tracing, I think you'll eliminate the need to do a substantial deep clean every time. So, so Brian, I was really surprised um, when I saw a recent webinar out of China about, com uh, yeah, about some of the buildings that um, have installed separate um, uh, air supplies on each floor. And, and then I guess I realized that, that in most buildings that we deal with, um, air supplies are shared. Um, and so air, so air circulates from one tenant floor to another tenant floor. Uh, any, any thoughts on, on what uh, tenants or landlords should be doing about this? Uh, are, are there ways for tenants to install um, uh, air purifiers within their own space? Uh, what can people do to protect themselves? Yes, yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. So in the ASHRAE guidance, there's actually specifications that talk to um, different air systems. So I, I definitely would push everybody to, to go look at that and see where that aligns with how your air systems are set up. And, and it provides like, it'll provide, and I'm just pulling it up right now, so it talks to, you know, centralized and floor by floor variable air volume. It gives a, a couple different outlines of what you need to do. And, and I'll push people to that because every site's going to be different. But there, ha there was outbreaks prior to this where people could trace back that a whole building got infected because everything was basically just recircling air the whole time. If we're increasing our fresh air coming into the space and exhausting out the rest of the stuff, you're going to see a significant, you know, decrease in the potential for cross-contaminating other spaces. And, and it's really important. That's why you want to increase that fresh air intake or more so than anything else. I think down the line, what's going to come out of this is from a building engineering standpoint, um, engineers are going to think about how they, how they can learn from this and engineer out some of these issues. So, these, these newer buildings that are going to come into play, you know, they're going to follow suit with those buildings uh, in China, that one in particular, I know which one you're talking about, and they can isolate those locations so they're able to, you know, exhaust out and vent out spaces. So I see that happening, and I also see from an architectural standpoint, people already thinking, I mean, put it this way, the hospitals were so, like, overrun with patients, at least I'm in New York, so I, I see we were, you know, ground zero for this whole thing, kind of, um, to a certain extent. And I'm seeing hospitals have to make changes to how they isolate patients. And I see it the same way in building systems, is how do we make these adjustments going forward so when the next thing hits, you know, it's a flip of a switch and we're already prepared for it. So I see that um, building systems and architecturally, things are going to change. Are you, uh, another question for you, are you seeing uh, buildings uh, centralized disinfectants uh, or disinfecting procedures for uh, materials coming into the buildings. Uh, I mean, you know, we basic, you know, we've traditionally had furniture, office supplies, Amazon, um, foodstuffs, food deliveries, all this stuff coming willy nilly into buildings. Are you seeing landlords take a more active role in making sure this stuff is is wiped down and disinfected before it goes into tenant spaces? I think early on, um, there was special attention to, you know, where, where is it coming from? Could it be poten potentially contaminated? Um, you know, take for example, people going to the supermarket, coming home, they're making videos of how to decontaminate things in line. You have a dirty side, clean side. Um, I, I think it depends on the situation. Um, if you're occupying a new space, let's say you're going to be doing construction and putting up new um, partitions or furniture, I would say right now in the early stages, I would have them do that and then build into the schedule seven days where it just sits there. So you don't have to really worry about it from a contact standpoint. But if you're receiving items as they come in, unless you're using like uh, compressed air to clean anything, it shouldn't be aerosolized. So you really, I don't see a huge need to wipe everything down. So long as people are washing their hands, they're not touching their face, they have good hygienic um, procedures in place, 
do I see it as a need for everything? No, but in some cases, yeah, probably it makes sense. So just one thing to add to that, um, some of the links we included, CDC has come up with, and as well as some other industry groups, guidance for specific industries. They have it just for package delivery. You can go to OSHA and see their guidance for the package industry, how to be safe. They have it for takeout food delivery services. I mean, you know, they really get granular in those types of things. And as a building owner, if let's say you're only allowing certain people to come in, like maybe it's an Instacart or maybe it's a, you know, certain food vendor, make sure they're following that stuff. Make sure that they're following the, the minimum recommended procedures to do that. I'm pretty confident that someone like Amazon or the Postal Service will be stepping up to meet those, but smaller companies may not. So, you know, making sure that downline there's minimum procedures and safety precautions before it comes to your building. That, that makes good sense. Well, we're, we're coming right up on um, 11 o'clock at this point, and I want to really respect everybody's time. Um, so, um, you know, we'll, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up at this point, um, encourage everybody to make sure that they've actually um, registered so we, we can um, circulate um, links and information to everybody. Um, so th thank you guys for, um, uh, for taking the time to prepare and participate today. I've seen a lot of really great comments uh, come in over the chat. So I think our, the people who um, are in attendance have gotten a lot out of it. And um, we look forward to um, future webinars and hopefully they'll be as good as today's. So. Um, Thank you all, and um, everybody stay safe. Okay. Right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.